Uh, I have you loud and clear. <laughs> Hello. 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 Welcome. Welcome. <laughs> <laughs> Science. And that is to say, physics, medicine, nature, or space, time, the brain, life, the universe. This week, will an artificial intelligence take over the world? Why do smaller dogs live longer than bigger breeds? And why do some people get hay fever while others are spared? These are some of the science questions that you've been sending in. And in this hour, the dream team we've assembled are going to answer them for you. I'm Chris Smith, and this is The Naked Scientist. The Naked Scientist podcast is powered by UKfast.co.uk. Well, first up, let's meet our panel for you. So, Sarah Harrison is a biologist. She's from the University of Cambridge. And, Sarah, you work on stem cells. What do you do with them? I Well, my specialism is about using stem cells to try and make organ-like structures and embryo-like structures in culture. So instead of being in the environment of an embryo itself. And stem cells have quite a lot of capacity to do this pretty spontaneously. If you leave them to do their own thing, they'll make neurons by themselves. But what they don't do very well is make these structures in a reproducible way. But why do we want to do that at all? Why do you want to grow mini bits of body in a dish? It would be useful to study how they develop by using these models rather than using real embryos. But it's also quite a, a good platform to start to test drugs. So you could give your, your pill to a, a Petri dish rather than a person to work out whether or not a drug that you're experimenting on might, might or might not work? Certainly with some organoid systems, sort of drug screening by using chemical compounds and putting them in dishes would work, yeah. Thank you, Sarah. So any questions relevant to biology, stem cells and embryos should go Sarah's way. Well, next to Sarah is sitting Simon White. He's a statistician at the MRC Biostatistics Unit, also at the University of Cambridge. Stats, that's a word that makes people shudder and often run a mile, Simon. But it hasn't in your case. You're you're a professional statistician. So have you any examples of uses and abuses of statistics to impart with us? I have. I mean, I think statistics is, is one of those words that instills fear. But really, we should just think of it as the idea of trying to understand what lots of numbers can tell us. And I think statistics shouldn't really be about, you know, formulae and complex numbers and lots of random, like, oh, the number of people in the room is five. But what does that tell us about the people in the room? Nothing much. That's what statistics is about, understanding what a number tells you rather than the number itself. It's pretty important though, isn't it? Because when we can start to ask questions about very large numbers of people, we can learn, for example, what things cause certain diseases or what things protect you against certain diseases. But you've got to look at lots of people to make sure that you, you reach the right conclusion. Uh, I might I might correct the word cause in what you just said. Sometimes a lot of them are associations rather than causal studies. You can tell we've got a statistician in the studio. So anything to do with maths and stats and that kind of thing should go Simon's way. That's Simon White. Sitting next to Simon is Peter Clark, who is the founder of the company Resurgo Genetics. Peter, what is that? So what we're trying to do is use some of the latest advances in machine learning that maybe we'll talk about later um, to really try and understand how cells work and how cells talk to each other and through their communication make you. Machine Re- learning? Machine what do you mean learning. by that? So this is really taking computers and, and getting them to look at lots and lots of data right, and trying to find the similarities and over, so seeing the same structures over and over again in data. Once you've got that, once you can start building up pictures of how things really work even when you maybe don't know ahead of time what they do. So, so the computer what... essentially teaches itself to see the relationships between if it looks at lots and lots of things that happen it can begin to see what happens when this happens and it can begin to therefore make inferences but you don't know how it's doing that it's just learning by looking at lots and lots of examples well in the same way that you don't we don't really yet properly know how your brain works for example yet you manage to survive in the world through lots of examples and and trying to imagine the ways of doing things but but just because it's a black box doesn't necessarily mean it doesn't work (laughs) So what would your company sell then? What would I come to you asking to buy off of Resurgo Genetics? Well, that's a good question uh, and one that our investors are asking (laughs) us a lot. (laughs) 
<laughs> what is, um, is there a business model? Well, I mean, I mean, I think the business model in the long run is that if you develop a, a, a far more sophisticated view of, of how these cells actually work and how they communicate to make you, that actually this becomes a very useful tool for medicine and agriculture and all sorts of other things. So, so Sarah's trying to grow cells in a dish. You're actually growing cells in a computer's memory. Yeah, there's a lot of there's a lot of overlap between what she does. We're almost sort of the c- computational modelling side of what what she's doing. Brilliant. Thank you, Peter. That's Peter Clark. Uh, And anything to do with cells and computers and computer modelling, Peter is your man. Now, sitting next to Peter is Olivia Reams. Now, she's a mental health researcher at the University of Cambridge. I understand that you have a way of boosting the panel's confidence before we get going, Olivia. How's that? I do. It is the best exercise ever, and I think everyone at home should try it as well because you'll feel a lot more confident, a lot more powerful. It only takes 30 seconds to two minutes. So I would like everyone at home to and everyone in the studio to please stand up. Off you go. Stand up. <laughs> I'm going to do this as well. Right, so what, what now? All right. Now, you want to place your feet about a metre apart. A metre? God, that's yes, quite a... Yes, about a metre apart. <laughs> now, metre. Go put on. your hands on your hips. Yep. Pull your shoulders back and lift your chin. Mm. This is called the Wonder Woman pose. And now keep this for about 30 seconds to two minutes. And essentially, the background... Are we allowed background... to breathe, Olivia? What's that? Are we allowed to breathe? You're allowed to breathe. Okay, You're allowed to breathe. <laughs> So basically, when we feel powerful, when we feel confident, our bodies expand. We take up more space. Um, We spread out. But you can also, if you're not feeling that way, if you're feeling a little bit insecure, you can trick your mind into thinking that you are actually powerful and confident. And the way to do that is to do the Wonder Woman pose. This can decrease your stress hormone levels. It can increase your assertiveness hormone levels. And it just leaves you feeling more confident. Um, So people driving don't try that obviously um, but guys do sit down tell us d- d- has that worked do you now feel imbued with with confidence ahead of the program absolutely yeah it's worked wonders i was a bit worried we were going to go into the rocky horror there <laughs> <laughs> but what what actually is the rationale olivia for doing this is it that it puts you in this because it's making you adopt a a, a posture which will be associated using your word there simon with power it makes you feel more potent even if you're not is that it, the, is that the rationale that's absolutely true in the animal kingdom and also when you're when we're looking at humans you know animals that feel powerful um chimpanzees that feel powerful also humans when they feel very powerful they just naturally adopt these expansive postures if you're not feeling like that you tend to slouch you tend to fold into yourself and a way to trick your mind into thinking otherwise you know a way to kind of fake it until you become it is to adopt this posture. Fake it till you make it. Exactly. Fake it till you make it. And uh, this is all based on research from Harvard. And the person who did this looked at, you know, the participants who adopted these postures and she measured their stress hormone levels um, and all sorts of other things. And it just made them more risk. uh, They took more risks. They felt more confident all sorts of positive benefits. Wonderful. Well, I hope that's going to be reflected in the standard of our broadcast this week. Thank you very much, Olivia Reams. Let's start with this question then, which is about mammals and how long they live for. This is for you, Sarah, and it's from listener Michael. In the mammal families, the bigger you are, the longer you live. For example, an elephant will live longer than a bear, who lives longer than a tiger, who lives longer than a mouse. But for dogs, it's the opposite. Why do smaller dogs live longer than bigger dogs. First of all, Sarah, is Michael right? Is that the case? Absolutely, it's the case. I think that's why this makes a great question. Because, as Michael says, larger mammals tend to live longer. So elephants tend to live a really, really long time. But when you look within species, the trend's almost reversed. And this is why, as Michael points out, for dogs, if you're a larger dog, you tend to have a shorter lifespan than a smaller dog. And it's not just dogs. This trend holds in humans as well. So the tallest ever human that's ever been recorded to have lived was about eight foot tall, eight foot 11. But this poor chap died at at 22 years old. So being large didn't gift this poor guy um, with longevity. Those people obviously are a little bit exceptional, aren't they? Because something made them become extraordinarily big compared to the norm. But going back to the original question about dog size, What is the reason why a bigger breed will be outlasted by a smaller breed? Well, we don't know the full answer to this. And we think the reason behind this is because larger animals grow a bit faster. 
This means they've got a higher resting metabolic rate, so they're exposed to more reactive oxygen species that can lead to DNA damage. And the other thing is, these animals have a lot more cells in each of their organs, which means more cells have higher chance of getting some kind of somatic mutation that might lead to cancer or tumorigenesis. But as I say, the full answer is not known. Thank you very much. Sarah, well, is it cause or is it effect? It's a statistician's nightmare and dream both at the same time. Simon, we've got this question here. What's the difference between absolute risk and relative risk? Now, you see this in the newspaper quite a bit. You see people reporting on a science or a medical study and they say the relative risk in this group was X compared to people who didn't smoke or, or drink or, or drive very fast the wrong way down the motorway or something. What does that terminology actually mean, though? This is a really good question, and it's one of these areas of science that's, over the years, become a very technical definition of risk. In its essence, absolute risk is the kind of risk we want to normally talk about. How many out of a thousand people will die from, say, uh, some sort of cancer, say lung cancer? That's what we want to know as a, a wider public when we're thinking about how we want to you know, whether we want to prioritise certain conditions, whether we should be worried about certain things. However, most studies are done by comparing different types of patient groups across different sort of demographics, age, sex, at which point you then make relative comparisons between those groups. So it's how much worse is this for men than, say, for women? So you get a relative risk from the study but that's not always the number that you want or even always the best number to make it helpful to understand. That's usually the absolute risk. And that's the distinction. Yes, it's about whether those what those numbers are in relation to. So an absolute risk is an actual countable number of people. A relative risk makes no sense on its own. It's only relative to something else. But if you've done your study carefully and you've got, for instance, a group of people who you didn't do anything to, you just watch them, and then you have a group who are analogous, they're identical to that group as far as you know, to the greatest extent possible, they eat the same things, they exercise the same amount, same body weight, all that, and they have the same sort of genetics background. And you do something to this other group, you're comparing, you hope, apples with apples. And so that that relative risk is actually very informative there, isn't it? If, if the second group that you do something to have a much lower chance of developing cancer or heart disease or something, that relative risk in the second group, it, it is informative. Absolutely. And a lot of a lot of the key results we know that inform public health and medicines that we use every day are based off relative risks from these kind of studies. So they're not useless, they're just a different way to communicate that information. And in fact, actually, the debate about how best to communicate risks is a long-standing challenge in statistics. I was going to say, it's, it's not something that the general public often get told how to interpret. They just see all these facts and figures reported in various media. And, and actually, no one ever really explains to you how you should interpret or, or understand a lot of those, those points. And, and this, I think, is why people get very confused when they see one week a news story says chocolate will protect you from dying of high blood pressure. And then the next week it says chocolate makes you fat and gives you high blood pressure. And people think, well, what should I believe? Again, this question of causation and association. So a lot of studies can't actually definitively prove that one thing leads to another. A lot of them are certain kinds of observational study. So we get these relative risks, but they're not always set in stone. Thank you, Simon. One to think about. Listening to The Naked Scientists, I'm Chris Smith, and this week we have a panel of experts who are answering your science questions. If you'd like to send in a question to one of these Q&A shows, the email address is chris at thenakedscientist.com. You can tweet at Naked Scientists, or you can also send them in via our Facebook page. On the way, we'll find out why some people are more susceptible to hay fever than others. We'll ask, is it true that you're more likely to die in a shark attack than a plane crash? And do machines, we're wondering, learn in the same way as humans. Now, here's one for you to think about, Olivia, and this is a question that's come in from Eleanor. What are your top tips for dealing with exam results nerves? There's lots of people in lots of countries at the moment who are all eagerly awaiting exam results that may or may not determine their future and if they're going to be off to university and things. What can they do to mitigate the risk of stress? Right, so if you're feeling stressed because you're waiting for your exam results or if you're feeling stressed because of any other reason, there is something that you can do and it's very effective. Basically, as soon as you feel this stress coming onto you, these worries, if there is something that you can do about the situation, do it. 
If not, then drop the thought and redirect your attention elsewhere. It's not easier said than done, though, Olivia. It's, you know, it takes practice. It takes practice. And this is all based on research that has looked at problem-focused coping versus emotion-focused coping. So when we ruminate a lot about something, when we obsess about something that has, uh, you know, something that's stressing us out, something that's worrying us... And it might interfere with our sleep, with our work. This can actually lead to anxiety and depression. So we want to avoid that. So you want to use problem-focused coping, which basically means focusing on solutions. In the case of exam results, there is nothing you can do about it. So drop the thought. And a way to make it easier on yourself to do that is to place your attention on something else. So Focus either on the task at hand or focus on your surroundings. If you're outside, feel the wind in your hair, hear the birds chirping, notice the color of the trees, be completely in the present moment. And what I think is very interesting, so Cornell actually did this study a while back and they asked people at the end of their lives what they regretted most and uh, if there was something that they could change and what most people said was they regretted that they had spent so much time worrying worrying does not lead to good things so it is best to just drop that if you can solve the problem solve it if not then just you know redirect your attention I was in a maternity unit once and there was this picture of a newborn baby and a sign underneath and it said the first five minutes of a newborn baby's life are the most terrifying of all, you know, the most the most uh, risky of all. And someone had written underneath, the last five minutes are pretty frightening too. <laughs> um, but I, I get your point that, you know, we do spend a lot of time worrying about things and perhaps we, we, we could avoid spending so much time worrying about them. And on that note, Peter, we've been looking at a story recently, we've had some headlines about computers at Facebook possibly developing a new language so they could chat to each other without humans understanding what they were saying. Tell us a bit more about this story. Um, Well, yeah, so that pretty much sums it up. Um, They were training these AIs to negotiate with each other. And what they were trying to do was to model the ways humans negotiate with each other. And so they were playing them lots and lots and lots of human interactions and trying to get them to learn, learn the ways that humans decide on what they're going to say and what happened was that then they set them free and got them to negotiate with each other and they ended up taking the human language and developing their own language on top of that apparently according to the stories but really they tried to it it was a very sort of simplistic thing which has been seen many times before in computer science research where you get two competing artificial intelligences that are negotiating with each other that they do develop these ways of simple interaction but it really was wasn't very anything very scary i mean there i could read out some of their (laughs) <laughs> Can you understand that, it? <laughs> um, well, I think it was... I'll, I'll just read you out one snippet of conversation. So Bob says to Alice, I can, I, I, everything else. And Alice says, balls have zero to me, 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 too. Right? So that was one of their exchanges. And actually what, what was happening is that they were actually tr- transmitting numbers with little English phrases. So the to me, to me, to uh, me, to uh, me... Ah, so those are was numbers. Actually, so they, that, that was them working out just a sort of almost random way of taking the words that... So it isn't just gibberish, there is meaning in that. No, there. there is meaning. They they basically have evolved a way of taking words or just happening to use those words as a way of communicating relatively simple things to each other. Were they also trying to work out the relative value of what they were negotiating for? Yes, I think so. So they were they were trying they were actually in a in a competitive situation. Because obviously a lot of a lot of human negotiation is about mostly misdirecting people if you're trying to get the better part of a, a negotiation. Yeah, you're trying I, to sell your car, you always want to get the best price. Do you think we could get them involved in the Brexit negotiations? Would that work? <laughs> With language like that, maybe. <laughs> but it seems it would make more progress, wouldn't it? Well, thank you very much for bringing us up to, to speed on it. Elon Musk, I think, went on the record. He's the guy who set up PayPal and, and other ventures, isn't he? And he said, I think Mark Zuckerberg, Chief, Chief Executive Officer of Facebook's understanding of AI is inverted commas, limited. Yeah, I think this was something slightly different in that actually Elon Musk had really been coming out and saying, as he has for a while, really highlighting some of the very real um, significant dangers of this technology and really calling for regulation. And this is, I guess, where the serious point comes, was that I, I think to some extent, maybe Mark Zuckerberg was pushing back against that. It's this 
debate about the level at which you're regulating these technologies, given that they can be potentially so powerful in the future. And I think that was the more interesting debate. We'll return to this subject later because I know we're going to be exploring whether or not there is a risk that things like artificial intelligences created originally by humans could end up overwhelming humans and taking over the world. We'll discuss that later. But Sarah, meanwhile, here's a biology question for you. Hi, my name is Jasmine and I have a question about hay fever. So as summer is the season one, a lot of us, including myself, suffer really badly from hay fever. I was just wondering if there's a reason to why some of us are more susceptible to pollen than others and what factors dictate who suffers from hay fever and who doesn't. Not one to be sniffed at there, is it? Who's got hay fever in, in the room then? Olivia, are you a hay fever? Sort of. I have fever? allergies to a million things, so hay fever is just another one on the list. Peter? No. No, you have I, escaped. Is it, well, I used to have it. I don't know what happened. Something oh happened. Your immune system forgot how to Yeah, it was slightly naughty. worrying. Simon? I'm afraid I'm all drugged up today. Another one. I, I also, I mean, I used to get hay fever. It seems to have got a lot better. So, Sarah, are we so unusual? It seems that you have a 100% hit rate in the room almost, apart from Peter. Well, I don't have hay fever, but it does affect what's estimated to be about a quarter of the people. And has that changed? In the world. Um, that has, so that's interesting. Pollution levels have been blamed a lot for a hay fever epidemic, if you like. But I don't think it's the only factor that increases your susceptibility to this, really. It's hay fever is a type of allergic rhinitis, if you want a more scientific name for it, if you like. Hmm. And this is the same disease that well, makes you allergic to pet hair and other indoor allergens. And it's not the allergen itself that causes your symptoms, as you alluded to. It's the, the immune system's inappropriate reaction. So the allergen is the, the thing in the environment that you are reacting to, like the pollen or the pet hair. Absolutely. And it's being seen by your immune system. Absolutely. And that causes the symptom, yep. which your we immune, call an allergy. Yep. Your immune system recognises molecules on the surface of these little particles and wrongly identifies these molecules as molecules belonging to an invader. And so the immune system reacts to try and clear your body of this invader. That means that you make antibodies and this leads to the cells making histamine. And it's this chemical histamine that inflames your nasal passages, makes your eyes run and your nose run and everything itch and make you feel really terrible. But Sarah, this is clearly bad. So why should the body allow that to happen? That's a good question. We don't really know. And there's a lot of genetic variation in how the immune system works and how it's set up. So a lot of it is thought to be down to this genetic variation. And in fact, it's a bit of a mysterious disease because scientists have only just, in fact, there's a paper last week that pinpointed the real offenders of all the different cell types in the immune system that were causing this allergic rhinitis. And that's the type of T cell called the Th2 cell. So a white blood cell. Yeah. Absolutely. And, and that cell is the orchestrator of that response, is it? Absolutely, as far as we know. But as I say, there's not as much known about it as you might expect for a disease that supposedly affects a quarter of the world's population. Because one highlight or one thing that's, that's a recurring theme on this subject is that we're all living a life which is too clean and sterile. And there is this idea of the hygiene hypothesis. We're not getting enough dirt exposure, not enough stimulation for our immune, immune response. And therefore, it, sitting there twiddling its thumbs thinks, well, I, I may as well react against something that's harmless then. Absolutely. And if you don't have enough of this exposure to this sort of thing in early life, it means you never really build up a tolerance to detecting these allergens and the molecules on their surfaces in the environment. It's also been linked to stress. I don't know whether Olivia knows anything about this, uh, a higher susceptibility to fever. No, you're absolutely right. And it is very true that if you're feeling stressed and allergies actually have been linked to poor mental health. And uh, again, we, we don't know which comes first with a lot of things in science. You know, th it's the case for this as well. But you're absolutely right. You know, when you're when you're feeling stressed, then your body is a little bit more susceptible and you could react even more to, you know, things in the environment that you normally wouldn't. Peter? Um, yeah, I mean, I think, I mean, I agree that I think everything's connected very much. And, and I think this is probably something that's going to come out more and more as the, over the next few years is the extent to which all of our systems are interconnected. But there is one thing that a lot of these allergies, you can actually cure them because really it's your immune system thinking that this thing is a bad thing that it's trying to get rid of. 
And you can, and these are, I, mean, I don't recommend anyone try this at home, but for example, if you're allergic to cat or dog hair, there are treatments where which you, by which you eat the allergen. The cat and dog hair goes through your digestive system and your body's immune system can actually learn that these things aren't bad for it. And so this is a way that, you know, for example, you don't start reacting badly to your um, to your meal that you've just eaten or something like this. And so it's a very interesting balance between reaction and non-reaction. You can play with that. Indeed, researchers at Addenbrooke's Hospital in Cambridge at Cambridge University have actually managed to turn people with life-threatening nut allergies into people who consume those nuts perfectly happily every day by doing exactly as you say it's there's something about the the presentation to the immune system of eating something which which can familiarize you and, and abolish the immune response olivia you know it i have exactly tried what you were speaking about and it's absolutely helped me with my allergies and also what I found very useful and uh, there's a lot of research on this uh, for people who have allergies to try an elimination diet where you pretty much eliminate everything you think you might be allergic to start with the bare basics which is exactly what I did then you work your way up and for example celery that was one thing that I was allergic to before because some doctors can be quite unhelpful. You know, they just see you for, for five minutes and that's about it and tell you to take more medication. I didn't want to go down that route. So I took matters into my own hands and basically I just started off by having, you know, like a centimeter of celery for two months and then just increased that and now I can have celery. Had you been eating much celery beforehand or was it something that you only did very rarely? So it's actually interesting because, okay, so I'm from Canada. And in Canada, my allergies are a lot better than here in England. And as much as I love England, I don't know what it is about the environment here that just makes me sick. So I'm okay eating celery in Canada. Not here, though. Now I am, but not before. We should caution people, though. If you do have life-threatening allergies, do be careful about this sort of presentation approach because the people who do this in the hospital start with literally amounts that you cannot even see and then slowly scale it up to a, in a safe way. So uh, it can be done. And and it is it is safe if done in the right hands, but but do be cautious about uh, just eating things you might be allergic to. Uh, got a question here for you, Simon, and this is actually a, a rather nail biting question, if I may say so myself, which has been sent in by Sophie. Is it true that you're more likely to die in a shark attack than from a plane crash? So shark or plane? What do you reckon? One, you sink your teeth into that one for us. Oh, this is one of those really interesting questions because it goes back to the heart of one of the problems of statistics is your absolute chance of dying from a shark attack is higher than your absolute chance of dying in a plane crash, as in the number of people on the planet that die from those two causes. However, that's not really a useful number because it doesn't put it into the context of any other forms of how you might die. And also, that's you have to remember that in statistics, that's sort of the population average, so across the entire planet. How, how likely you are to die from a shark attack is a very different question. Because if you never fly, you're never going to die from a plane crash. And so if you don't go in the sea, mm. you're not going to get eaten by a shark either. So there's a big, big difference there between population level statistics and individual level numbers. I was just wondering, if is it more likely that you die of a shark attack after your plane has crashed into the sea? Ah, yeah. How does or is that, it combin- combinatorial? How does that sit with you? Actually, uh, also part of that question is um, you're more likely to be in a plane crash, but su- people survive a lot of plane crashes now. But how many of them get eaten by sharks? Actually, there are very few plane crashes over water. Simon, thank you very much. You're listening to The Naked Scientists, of course, your favourite science show of the week. And I'm Chris Smith, and with me are a panel of experts ready to take on your science questions. We have with us Sarah Harrison, a statistician, Simon White, and also a mental health expert, that's Olivia Reams, and they're all from the University of Cambridge. And we also have Peter Clark, who is the founder of Resurgo Genetics. But he was at the University of Cambridge originally too, so very much a Cambridge posse this week. If you'd like to get a question into a programme like this, remember you can email chris at thenakedscientist.com or tweet at Naked Scientist. Please send them in now because we're beginning to put that programme together as we speak. Now, as promised earlier, we've got a little quiz for our panel and uh, you can try this at home as well or if you're in the car, you can try it 
in the car. What we're going to do is divide our panel in the studio up into two teams. So we're going to have uh, Olivia and Peter together, and we'll have Sarah and Simon. That's nice. We've got all the, all the S's together. Uh, I will ask you, team one is going to be Sarah and Simon, and team two is going to be Peter and Olivia. I'm going to ask you a question, and you obviously have to tell me what you think. You can confer work out what you think the answer is and it's the best of three and uh, you are competing for a prize that money can't buy which is the the naked scientist big brain of the week award okay so here we go so you guys sarah and simon are up first now death valley in california um is, is one possible clue for you what's the hottest place on earth and how hot do you think it is is it the surface of the earth are yeah we when, talking? when, when we say we, on we earth yeah i had a thermometer and i put it down outside what? So not in a so, volcano then? No, you no. couldn't, couldn't <laughs> get away with a volcano. <laughs> I think we were both thinking the same thing there to, to outstart Chris, obviously. Um, obviously the, the, the thermometer would melt in a mm, volcano. I like course, the way you're thinking yeah. though, but what, what do you reckon then? So hottest place on, on Earth and how hot? Oh, uh, I gave you a clue of the location. I mean, a desert would be obvious. Yes, yeah, you would think a desert. I mean, how hot? The clue was in the name. I said Death Valley. Yeah. How hot, how hot do you think it was? Ooh, uh, 60 or 70? I said 65, something like that. Yeah, split the difference. Yeah. 60, we'll yeah. go with 65 no. degrees C. Oh. No, it's actually the, the hottest temperature there is at 50, 50 okay. degrees Celsius. The record uh, set in 1913 was 56 Celsius, but that was a one-off, so you're, you're a little bit high in your estimation. Right, so zero for you so far. You're doing very well. Uh, let's move over to the other team, who are Peter and... Uh, uh, Olivia, when it's hot, there is nothing quite like an ice cream. But which country on earth do you think eats the most ice cream? What do you think? It's got to be somewhere be the hot. States, hasn't it? I'd imagine. The States? Don't you think? We can go with that. Um, sure. I mean, is, is this a, I mean, a, I love ice cream, and I'm from a, Canada, yeah. so. But, but with respect, uh, there's one of you, Olivia, and um, so. Yes. And, uh, you're not going to eat more than the. the is whole. This, I mean, this is not per capita, then. <laughs> is this per capita? No, th this is actually the, taking a the country, title, the, the title country, country. That's, that's got the biggest appetite, as in right. en masse. I would imagine that had to be America, the US. Sure. I own. mean, the waistline. I, I suppose if you go by the waistline. <laughs> we'll just go by I the waistline. I should not be saying of, that, but. Massive tubs of. If you go into an American supermarket, it's ice cream. All right, all right. That's why I love American so your answer supermarkets. Is Let's go with the that. The United States of America. <laughs> oh. Actually, the answer is now China. They stole oh, the really? they stole the ice cream crown from the US. So you were on the right wow. lines. In 2014, China consumed a massive 5.9 million liters of ice cream every single year. The UK mm. much more svelte, uh, only 0.35 million liters in 2014. But it's a small country, of course. I'm clearly living in the wrong country. <laughs> um, I couldn't possibly comment. Now the next question. Back to Team One. That's Sir Simon and Sarah. After finishing your ice cream, why not go for a nice swim? waiting 30 minutes, of course, for it to go down. Um, with that in mind, what's the average temperature of the sea around the coast of the UK? What do you think the answer to that one is? Uh, oh, well, we've got the uh, the current that warms us up coming across the Atlantic. So that's nice warm. And then we've got the North Sea coming down. Yeah. So the average around the whole coast of the UK. In summer. In so summer. summer sea temperature, yeah. It always feels like minus 40 whenever I go swimming. But, but, um, but then we go but, skating. <laughs> <laughs> that's true. Um, yeah, maybe... Going to have to hurry you. Teen, oh, the teens? Let's go 12. Like 12? 12. I 12. said 12. Not bad. Actually, you're going to have to have a... Oh, oh no. But because the, the answer is actually 15 to 20 degrees is the average. So you're a little bit low. It's a, it's a bit warmer than you had anticipated. As a statistician, I must object to giving a point answer. Can I give an <laughs> interval next time? I'm sorry, I'll try, I'll try harder next time. Right, OK, back to team two. Uh, we're going from wet to dry now. Where do you think, you two, the driest place is on Earth? I want the driest place on Earth. Mm, I think it may be some patch of dry rock in Antarctica. We can go with that. <laughs> That's just a guess, but I think there's some very, very dry bits of Antarctica. Okay. Um, but it's a little yeah. bit of a guess. I, I, I mean, I was thinking, I don't know why, for some reason, maybe because I just loved it there, but I was going to say someplace in Morocco, but we can go with Antarctica. I like your answer better. Chris can It's going us? to be Antarctica? <laughs> yes. 
Ah. You got a point. Yay! <laughs> it's uh, McMurdo Dry Valleys in Antarctica. Hasn't seen any rainfall for over 14 million years. This area is surrounded by extremely high mountains and they block even the flow of ice. So you have a point. Team two is in the lead at the moment. Nice. So we're back to team one and that means the best you can do is hope to save your reputation. <laughs> So try this one then. So speaking of lack of rainfall, how much of the earth is covered in desert, do you think, Sarah and Simon? Well, that's going to be a very small percentage. It depends whether we count Antarctica as a desert uh, or that small uh, part of Antarctica. Uh, uh, it's, about, it's only 33%, so about 3 or 4%. I'd go 4%, yeah. Let's go 4%. Three percent. Oh, if you'd been a bit closer, I might have been more lenient. Um, but actually, it's about ten percent. Um, so seventy-one percent of the Earth's surface is ocean. So I thought you were going to be on the right lines there, Simon. The remaining twenty-nine percent, or around a third, is desert, and that might seem high, but the definition of a desert is anywhere that has a moisture deficit over a year. So more evaporation than rainfall. So our winners are going to be Team Two, but we'll ask them the last question anyway because we'll see if they can if they can do a good job on this because it's quite a nice uh, quite a nice summer question. This one. So so. We'll We'll stick with the idea of um, deserts and sand. What is the record for the tallest sand castle ever built, you two? Peter and Olivia, what do you think? Tallest sand castle. You mean in metres? Yeah. You can give me metres. I, I suppose I could quickly try and do a conversion. But, yep, <laughs> metres would be good. And decimal points as well, please, to keep I mean, um, Simon know, happy. The bigger, the better. So. <laughs> um, I need a height, roughly. Oh, 50 feet. Okay, we'll go with that. Um, can we have that in metres? Uh, I'm <laughs> not sure we can. Program. I think we need to ask the statistician to do the quick mental conversion. <laughs> that's 100 metres. Yeah, yeah, that's quite tall. That's that's quite high. 50 feet is not 100 metres. I didn't say I had to give the right answer. Yeah. Yeah. We need the confidence don't, interval. Don't, don't listen to him. Um, just give me an answer in metres. Oh, I, 15 metres, 20 metres. Between 15, 15, 15 and 20 15 metres. metres. Team, oh. team two are on fire. Really? The answer is actually 14.84 metres. Oh, and um, the record was set on a beach in India on February the 10th, wow. 2017. Ooh. It took nine days to build this uh, sandcastle and it had a base circumference of 160 metres. So that is quite a prestigious mm. and prodigious it's, size for a sandcastle. Uh, well, I think it's getting there. Yeah, it certainly is. Right, OK, back to some more questions. I've got a question here for you, Sarah, from Christine. I have read that the majority of humans have a circadian rhythm that is longer than 24 hours. If we live on a planet that has a 24-hour day, why would human circadian rhythms be different? Would our daily exposure to light change our rhythms? So tell us, Sarah, what are circadian rhythms and why don't they match the fact that our planet has a 24-hour day? Why are our rhythms different to that? So I think you can define a circadian rhythm as any physiological process which occurs in cells on a 24-hour cycle or thereabouts. And each cell in the body has a set of genes which act as a, an internal clock, making sure that every cell can keep to this 24-hour rhythm. And in fact, the word circadian is Latin and roughly translated it means about a day. But the question is absolutely right. The average human circadian rhythm is a little bit uh, longer than that. It's 24.15 hours thereabouts. But actually, this is genetic variation. So individual by individual, every person has a slightly different length to their circadian rhythm. So some people have circadian rhythms a little bit shorter than 24 hours and some people have circadian rhythms that are a little bit longer. And in fact this genetic circadian rhythm can actually impact on your your day-to-day -day behavior and maybe Olivia will know a little bit more about this but if you're a morning lark sort of person so you're good in the mornings you can get yourself going so certainly not me then you tend to have a shorter circadian rhythm and if you're a bit more of a night owl then you tend to have a longer circadian rhythm. So Simon, now, night time or, or owl? I see you sort of nodding there. <laughs> well, I, I used to be a very much a morning person and then I went to university and, and that slipped. <laughs> yeah, I'm definitely a, a, an owl. I, I don't function so well in, in the morning. Peter, you lark or owl? Definitely an owl. Yeah, Olivia, you're an owl or you're off to bed early? Not an owl, off to bed very early. Isn't that interesting? <laughs> so why does that happen? Even though each cell has its own individual clock, all of these clocks need to be ticking with the same frequency, if you like, otherwise that would be no good to anyone. So the brain has a master clock, if you like, in an area called the suprachiasmatic nucleus. And this master clock can be entrained by environmental light, essentially. So it's connected to the retina, so it can sense 
light coming in from the environment and it's also connected to a hormonal system so it can send a long range signal to all the cells in the body telling them essentially what time it is. So as the questioner said our circadian rhythm can be entrained to the 24 hour day and that's why evolution has tolerated a little bit of variation either side of that because every day that you're exposed to this environmental light that means that your circadian rhythm will be there about 24 hours. If you take away these extrinsic cues, essentially go and live in a house with no windows for a little bit, your rhythm will drift back to what's been genetically encoded. So it will slightly vary from this 24-hour cycle. And this is what's called a free-running circadian rhythm, if you like. I think some blind people who lack the connection between the retina and the brain that you mentioned, they do have that, don't they? And they're, So their clock actually wanders with time it, it slowly drifts off and that they're in a state of almost perpetual jet lag but then they do have a, an effect of trying to maintain a, a regular cycle and getting up at a certain time by setting an alarm clock and that can help to keep them on track it really can um i think there's been lots of people who want a better cure for jet lag um and there was a study in the late 90s i think which uh showed or seemed to show that if you shine light on the back of your knees you could cure jet lag but later this turned out as bizarre as it is it turned out to be to be not the case so i think the only way to really cure jet lag is expose to yourself to that early morning light and get yourself back in the rhythm good stuff and a nice bright walk will probably make you happy as well which is the thrust of this question what does science say is the best way to be happy what do you think two things number one relationships. One of the longest running studies on happiness done by Harvard showed that contrary to, you know, what um, most people's goals are today, which, you know, a lot of surveys are asking young people what their goal in life is, and it is to become famous and wealthy. It is not these that make us happy. Rather, it is having strong and supportive relationships. Number two, just going for a walk, being in nature makes you more creative and just resets your system. There was a study done where they took people away from their environment and put them in the wilderness for just a few days and measured their stress levels and their anxiety levels and their overall feelings of well-being before they went and after they went and Mm -hmm. the difference was stark. Mm -hmm. Staggering. Yeah, no, it's really relaxing and just uh, it improves your well-being and just makes you feel happier. Thanks, Olivia. You're listening to The Naked Scientist with me, Chris Smith. And this week we're answering the science questions that you have been sending in. Um, Let's just quickly consider this question which has come in for uh, you, Peter. Do machines learn the same way as humans do? What are the differences? That's from Ian. What do you think? So, yes. I mean, I think they do. there are similarities. So the way really you can imagine your brain working, there's, there's a bunch of neurons, there's maybe about 100 billion neurons in your brain, and they're all wired up, and each one of them is taking in a bunch of inputs from another neuron, deciding what how to behave and firing out its message, which is then being input to all these other neurons. So really, this is a fairly simple core underlying structure behind um, all of the all of the brains in nature. Um, But really, it's actually how all of these neurons work together and how you have this property in nature which is called emergence, where a lot of sim- where a lot of simpler things interacting with each other lead to a higher level, more complex behaviour, and and this you see this over and over again. And one one of the best places to see that is in say a, um, a bee's nest or something like that, where um, each individual bee is behaving in a relatively simple way, but together they manage to create these huge hives which can think in far more sophisticated ways than anyone any one of the individual bees can um, and the same process is happening inside your brain and actually across your body in all sorts of other ways um, so it's really and this these are connectionist they're called connectionist models so they're models of how simpler components can come together and through their interactions lead to a higher level more complex behavior and and our brain works like that, and these artificial neural networks work in exactly the same way, exact by the same process. Um, there are a bunch of aspects in which what well, which they're not the same. You know that they're in, in so we really don't understand all sorts of aspects of how human brains work, um, and we also don't understand how cells work. So we can't really say that in a, in a very precise way they work in the same way as as the way humans learn, but they do use very very similar. Um, processes. Can I play this question which was sent in by David? It's been keeping him awake at night and it's sort of relevant to this and we alluded to it earlier. Are people in the field complacent about an AI takeover? Could Skynet and the Terminator apocalypse actually happen? 
So in other words, what he's getting at is could the mechanisms that you were referring to about how machines learn, how we're writing programs that enable computers to learn and become intelligent in their own right, could they potentially invent a way to see us off the planet? Yes, they could. Um, that's the short answer. Um, you, we're dealing with um, amazing technologies. There's an amazing advance happening. And, and as this unfolds into society and starts to transform the ways um, we do everything, it's probably going to be a far larger impact than the Industrial Revolution or, say, the Internet or electronic communications because we can see a point in within the next ten, between sort of 10 and 30 years, depending on um, your particular person you believe as where it's happens, where actually we're going to develop technologies. We're going to develop um, these types of artificial neural technologies which will then surpass human capability. The moment that happens, we've developed these systems. The moment we've, we develop these systems, they will then be able to develop systems that are more sophisticated than themselves. So this is the idea that you get this sort of sudden runaway process whereby within uh, a relatively short space of time, computational power um, starts, starts you, you hit the physical limit. You know, you're hitting physical limits, which means that it's incomprehensible compared to the way our brains are. I mean, it really is... It is the probably the most uh, transformative point in not um, you can make the argument whether it's the most transformative point in human history or most transformative point in uh, in the history of life on Earth. And I suspect you could probably make the second point, um, but it's it's one or the, it's one or the other, and it's a very potentially very dangerous situation, and we all need to sort of wake up and really question about what world we want to live in because at the end of the day these intelligences can do almost anything but they need an objective and so what we need to do is to think about objectives think about how we um, frame this and try and make sure that for example in the Terminator apocalypse you know it was its objective was set I think to stop war right and so the way you stop war is to get rid of humans because humans create war so you need to be very be careful very, what you wish for yeah so yeah. it's it's unintended combination of Badly specified objectives and unintended consequences are the, are the things that, and yeah, and also we need to we need to make it act in human for the human good and, and the good of the planet. Well, that's a sobering thought to move on from, isn't it? Now let's talk about biology for a minute because Kevin is wondering, Sarah, are there any true single-celled organisms that regularly consume multi-celled organisms for food? And is that such a surprising question? Well, it's certainly a great question because it makes us think about how we view the food chain. And we tend to think of it as a linear progression where a small animal or organism is eaten by a larger ag animal and then a larger animal still eats the large animal. But actually feeding really, when we define it properly, is more about one organism drawing resources, probably organic compounds and nutrients, um, from another so when you think about it like that, actually unicellular organisms are drawing resources from multicellular organisms all the time. It's just we don't call that predation, we call it parasitism. And this is really common in evolution because if there's a niche, evolution will evolve some kind of organism to exploit it. So when you think about it, when you think of an arch predator like a great white shark, you think those poor people who die in the plane crash... The only thing above the arch predator in the ecosystem is the parasites which feed off it, really. There are examples where, perhaps more true to the question, a large single cell organism can engulf very microscopic multicellular organisms as well. And I suppose if, if, you're, if you're thinking about a human being is outnumbered by the bacteria that live on the human being and some of those bacteria are surviving by damaging our own cells, busting them open and then hoovering up, you know, they vacuum up the, the debris and, and eat it and assimilate it. That's sort of what you're saying. So in, in essence, a, a single-celled thing like a bacterium is eating you, therefore deriving a, a life from us. If it's pathogenic, yeah. In some cases, there's a bit of a back and forth. So even though, say, a bacteria is drawing some resources from its host, it might also be giving something back that's beneficial. So these things can work both ways as well. And then it's less one feeding off the other. Which is why evolution allows it to happen, Pretty I suppose, much. isn't it? Thanks very much, Sarah. Now, Simon, a bit of biology actually for you. This is from Alex, who says... Why does everything seem to both give and cure cancer? 
So on the one hand, we're being told that causes cancer. On the other hand, you're being told, oh, the same thing cures cancer half the time. So why do we get these mixed messages in the media? Well, there are actually very few studies which have shown strong causal links between these factors and cancer. A lot of them are associations. And one of the main problems with a disease like cancer when you're trying to study its effect, when various aspects on the outcomes of cancer, is that cancer is really an older age disease. I generalise there, not all cancers, but in broad strokes. So if we're looking at people now in their 30s and we say, what do you do? We won't really know whether that has an effect until those people are in their 60s. So that would be a causal study. Unfortunately, that takes 30 years. And in terms of public health, we kind of need an answer yesterday. So we do a lot more association studies. And that's where some of these competing, contrasting results come from. There's also a lot of issue with especially diet studies about how we interpret and record diet. So diets have intrinsically changed over the last 50 years. Foods that we have available now in the UK weren't around 30 years ago. So can we really say that the impact of various lifestyle factors will cause cancer? Probably not. So when people turn around and say the Mediterranean diet, which is dominated by olive oil, a lot of fresh fruit and vegetables, a little bit of red wine every day, that sort of lifestyle and diet combination, that will improve your mortality. Actually, that's in the context of people who came through a very different life experience, lived a, a long while ago, really. A- and and, and, and lived modern, in the Mediterranean. A- and lived in a different geography. <laughs> yes. um, and we've now got people who are a different age group eating a different diet really en masse and with a different upbringing and therefore it may not be relevant. And and this is one of the issues in statistics is generalising results. So we can't do the study we want to do. It's not ethical and it would cost too much money. So we have to work with the information and data we can get and then we have to work out how much that can generalise. And this is really a, a one of the great questions of statistics is from the study we have and the people we have what can we say? What can't we say? I'm, I'm always, statisticians, I kind of call us the buzzkills of science because <laughs> we're usually the ones in the corner going, hmm, is that really true? <laughs> but something like the study done by Richard Doll, who's died now, but he famously did the smoking doctors study and that was a very well-powered study, had a very big group of people that were followed for 50 years mm. and did categorically show that there was a very big excess of chest diseases and cancers in the individuals who smoked compared with the people who didn't smoke. Yeah, and and that's the sort of the long-term study. It was still an association um, because he didn't force certain people to smoke or not smoke. He wouldn't have been allowed to do that. And and that is one of the uh, (laughs) that is one of the ethical requirements. So to, to really be true whether something causes cancer or not, we have to get a group of people, give it to them, and then another group of people who don't have it, and then follow them for 30 years. Peter? Um, So, yeah, I mean, I think this is a really good example with smoking, where you have a very binary thing, right? And it's obviously very bad for you, but it still takes this huge, great, long 50-year study to work out that smoking is bad for you. And really, this is where, in some sense, you can make the case that statistics and these types of studies actually fail public health and public good because they're not going to determine all of the things in the world that are dangerous for us because things that where you where you have a very broad exposure to something which is not binary and easily definable like whether you smoke or not that actually wouldn't it be fair to say that there could be a, a vast number of things that we're being exposed to every day which are dangerous to us that we're not actually being properly we need a different framework for working out those things rather than these frameworks, which actually they, they can't pick those th- signals out from statistical background. Well, I mean, just just to defend statistics uh, from some comments you made there, statistics is about understanding what the data can tell you. And I don't think anyone would say that the statistics are wrong. They're a tool. What the, what the good, yeah, as, the as good one person said it to me the other day, that, that there is reality and you can't call reality wrong when it doesn't agree with what you think is going on. Yes, I mean, statistics is uh, it's a way of quantifying evidence. And uh, this is where an abuse of statistics occurs when people run these studies and say, oh, you know, drinking coffee increases your life expectancy. That's, I was really buoyed up when I saw that study. I thought it was brilliant. And, I should live uh, forever the way uh, I'm going. And, 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 but the problem is, is they've reduced it down to a single aspect, coffee. 
And we all know that that's not reality. So the statistics has picked out from all of the various parts of the diet and all the various lifestyle factors that coffee has this effect, but in combination with a whole host of other things. And yes, these problems are very complex. That doesn't mean that the statistics is there to tell you, actually, we probably don't know. Thanks, Simon. One for you, Olivia. And uh, this is coming from Stacy. Does social media affect mental health? So very big business, social media these days, Facebook, Twitter and everything. Facebook have stats suggesting the last thing that a very high proportion of people do before they go to bed is they actually look at their Facebook page. Is this having an impact on people's psychological well-being? It absolutely does. Looking at Facebook, being on your computer right before you go to bed actually disrupts your sleep. That can increase your risk of anxiety and depression. And also being on social media a lot has been linked to narcissism, to low self-esteem. Right now, there are issues like cyberbullying, online harassment. And also, you know, when you go on Facebook, everyone seems to post these rosy, you know, to to kind of create this glamorized view of their life. Everything looks rosy, looks beautiful, which might not necessarily be reality. And uh, this study, which has been uh, cited a lot in research, it, it was really interesting. It was showing that if you're looking at Facebook and if the stuff that you're seeing makes you feel jealous, then if you're feeling jealous, that can lead to depression. But if you're not feeling jealous, you're okay. So, so are you saying then that, that actually your friends being happy could mm-hmm. make you unhappy? Exactly. So if you, well, it's not so much your your friends, I suppose it's uh, people see it more as showing off, I suppose, you know, because people seem to post uh, status updates like, oh, you know, I just got, and mainly positive factors, I just got this promotion, look at my, this wonderful meal that I'm having, this trip that I've been on. They're not going to tell you about the things in their life that aren't going so well, like the fights that they're, they had with their boyfriend last week maybe their you know their boss said something to them and they were crying that yeah, sued day. for that olivia <laughs> yeah if you, if you put that on facebook it's quite so. funny because we went to san diego oh, it's about uh, 10 years ago now we won an award so we flew down to la to get this award went drove down the coast of san diego and uh, you know like all good people doing sort of journalistic things i took my recorder along mm-hmm. went to university of california san diego met uh, james fowler who was based there then and he'd just published a paper showing that if you have friends on facebook who gain weight and get fat then you get fat because it sort of resets the social norm so you're more likely to feel comfortable being fatter so you let yourself go a, a little tiny bit uh, i was I, I knew the statistician would be straight in on this one simon <laughs> well uh, so it's really interesting uh, things like facebook because it's a form of sort of observer bias so mm. it's exactly this idea is that you are only shown part of the picture yeah. and humans have very bad uh, biases about trying to infer the incomplete. I, mean, I don't want to use the phrase, there are things you know, there are things you don't know, and there are things yeah. you don't know, you don't know. But that's essentially how the world is. And we're very bad at trying to fill in the gaps. Mm. And and that's just true in lots of areas of our daily mm. lives. And that bias, that cognitive bias, means that when we observe, in, because Facebook is a data, it's information about your world, you, you only see part of it, and then you make an inference about how the world is. Mm-hmm. And that's very bad statistics. So what do you think, Olivia? Should we, should we stay away from these platforms then? Is that what should be prescribed if you're at risk of being a bit depressed or, or having fear of missing out or whatever people are dubbing it? You shouldn't use it. That's the answer, basically. Um, This study was done in Denmark recently. It uh, looked at over 1,000 people and they showed that quitting Facebook for just one week, it actually led to increased life satisfaction and to more positive emotions. And also, if you want to sleep better, don't look at social media right before you go to bed. A lot of teens and tweens, they actually wake up in the middle of the night and go on their phones to see what their friends posted online. That's so bad for you. And when you're that young, you know, you're you're growing and developing so you need you need restful sleep um thank you for that uh, olivia and um, so watch your facebook exposure i suppose is is the bottom line isn't it thank you to all our guests as well we've run out of time we have to stop sarah harrison simon white peter clark and olivia reams the program was put together by tom crawford do join us next week though when we're going to be taking a journey into space via your senses until then though it's goodbye from us here at the naked scientists which is supported by the eps the SRC, the SDFC and Rolls-Royce and produced at Cambridge University. Thank you.